Good afternoon. Thank you, Non-Traditional Employment for Women, for partnering with AMFP's new New York City chapter on this program. I'm Andrew Weinberg, Director of Business Development for LF Driscoll Healthcare, and I am the founding president for AMFP, which stands for Association of Medical Facility Professionals. Like our tagline says, leadership in the healthcare built environment. This is for everyone connected to that healthcare built environment. On the owner side, that includes everyone in healthcare capital planning, design and construction, healthcare real estate, and facilities. And on the other side of the coin are the service and product providers, including architects, engineers, contractors, owners, reps, specialty consultants, and vendors of all types of products and services. Essentially, everyone working in the healthcare market sector. Our number one goal is to build community for everyone in healthcare. We are filling a void we had here in New York City, and we are working together with other professional associations like NEW. We already have over 225 members in our first five months alone, representing 10 healthcare systems in our region and over 150 companies that are doing work in the healthcare market sector. So I'd like to thank NEW again for partnering on this program, and I'll turn it back over to them. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kathleen Colhane, President of Non-Traditional Employment for Women. Thank you for joining us today for the third event in our new digital series, New Conversations. I wanna thank our esteemed panelists, all industry leaders, and the Association of Medical Facilities Professionals for partnering with us today. Thank you to our sponsors for their continued support and commitment to NEW. I'm excited to announce that every dollar donated, up to $10,000, will be matched by Agco Electrical, an avid supporter and partner of NEW. Make a gift to NEW to support new tradeswomen and their families by visiting new-nyc.org slash donate or click the link in the chat. Every dollar counts towards supporting new tradeswomen to stay safe during the pandemic and to pursue their career dreams. Enjoy today's conversation and thank you for being with us. Hello, my name is Nora Vega, and I'm from Brooklyn, New York, local 157 Union Carpenter. I was born in Puerto Rico, San Juan, Puerto Rico. I came here around the age of five. We came here for that American dream, and my mom, as a single mother, did the best that she could to get us through. You introduced me to a lot of women that, honestly, you may see in movies. These women are, they're strong, they're confident, they are positive and they're always there to help you. Even if you're a different trade, they'll be like, you're my sister, I'll see you on site. It works on your self-esteem. It works on, on you seeing a, a future wider than what we normally are you know, told we can do. We're stronger than we think. New, New is always there for me. They've always been there for me. They were there when I didn't even realize that people actually care enough that much. And I'm always here for New because they're, they're legit, they're, they really care about you. Every dollar that we, you all donate today will be matched by ADCO up to $10,000. What a gift. Thank you again to new board member Catherine Moss and Ron Simone for inspiring this gift. Uh, please click on the link in the chat to make your gift to support new tradeswomen today and every dollar counts. I, I can tell you that these women are incredible and every dollar is, goes a long way in helping support their career growth and it's, it's a dollar well spent. So please, please consider donating. I'd like to now take a few minutes to introduce our esteemed panelists. We've got a great group for you today. Um, and uh, please welcome, starting with Suwan Elsie Lowe, Senior Director, Office of Design and Construction at Montefiore Medical Center, welcome. Christine Flaherty, Senior Vice President of the Office of Facilities and Development at New York City Health and Hospitals. Christopher Shaw, Vice President, Healthcare Leader at LF Driscoll, Healthcare and New Board Member. Jacoby Ricard, Senior Director of Planning, Design and Construction at Mount Sinai, Morningside. Got Christopher Prockner, Partner, Healthcare Practice Leader at Jaros Bowles. 
We've got James Crispino, Global Healthcare Leader and Principal at Gensler, and Rich Steimel, Senior Vice President, Principal in Charge, Healthcare at Lendlease. So welcome panelists, thank you for being here with us today. We're really excited to have a conversation with you. And I'm gonna start uh, our panel discussion today with a question for Chris Shaw. Um, Chris, for, for, a long term, for the long term, hospitals must take a hard look at prioritizing infrastructure upgrade projects. What is, the, what is the return on investment for building new HVAC systems and improving medical gas infrastructure that you're seeing across the industry today? Thanks, Kim. Um, before I answer that, I just want to say thank you again to, to uh, New for hosting this, uh, for, for all of everybody on this uh, panel today. Thank you for doing this for us. Um, and Kim, thanks you, thank you for moderating this. Uh, appreciate it. So as far as infrastructure, um, you know, medical gas, I mean, we, we've all seen the COVID craze with medical gas. We needed more, more capacity. So I think that was a big lesson learned for, for the industry. And uh, a lot of hospitals are addressing that in their future planning. Um, I would say that as far as prioritizing infrastructure projects, um, you, uh, going with new, new equipment, more efficient equipment will, will definitely be a return on investment. A lot of ho uh, hospital facility people will agree with that. Um, they will all be, they also be more uh, compatible to new technology out there as far as building systems that can all monitor themselves, which I think is in the long term the right way to go. Um, as far as medical equipment, um, there's always a need for new infrastructure for all medical equipment. Typically, we do this with each individual project. We, um, so I think, uh, you know, as they, as they look at a master plan, you look at all your different uh, locations in your hospital, how you plan that out is, is a big key to, to make sure you're keeping up with the infrastructure needs of all this new equipment out there that changes every minute, right? Um, another key thing to keeping up with infrastructure and looking at that as a whole would be the environment and wellness factor of this. I mean, people are, patients are, are going to start asking about surgeons and they're going to start asking about the HVAC in the building, right? Well, you know, I'm looking to, my wife and I are looking to maybe go, uh, maybe plan a trip next spring, we'll see. But, you know, I'm looking at all these websites and different hotels and now it's funny, they, they're publicizing that they have separate ventilation to, to spaces. So I think you're going to, you're going to see that a lot of more. You're going to, you're going to have people asking these questions um, before, before they come into these facilities, and it could mean they're going left instead of right. And it might, it might, it might really be a, a key factor then to decide which medical care they're going to seek. Um, you know, ultimately the patient and the family comfort is going to be a major factor here um, to maybe future reimbursement policies, right? So, so infrastructure is going to play a key role into future reimbursements and just where you're going to end up going for, um, you know, choosing which hospital you're going to go to. Um, the last thing I would say is, you know, as far as planning long term, the Climate Mobilization Act, Local 97, is going to be a, a key thing for a lot of hospitals to keep up with infrastructure needs. You know, by 2030, um, it's you got to reduce your carbon footprint by 40 percent, and then by 80 percent by 2050. So, I think long term, hospitals have to plan for this. Uh, they have these facilities are old, and if they don't do this over the next 20, 30, 40 years, they're going to they're going to get huge fines. So that's going to be a, a, a perfect example of how they have to plan and invest in infrastructure right now. Yeah. Thank, thanks for sharing your thoughts on that, Chris. Rich, would you be able to elaborate further from your point of view on uh, return on investment and in upgrading uh, HVAC and, and medical gas infrastructure? It's definitely a great opportunity and it's a, it's a, it's a group of uh, real industry leaders and I'm glad to be a part of it. And just to reinforce some of Chris's points, uh, to go back to the medical gas as an example, it was uh, quite common uh, during the last surge to uh, convert single patient bedrooms to accommodate two beds. It may have been one bed and one stretcher, but the bottom line was we had to expand and extend the, uh, the medical gas systems and even the power to accommodate the, uh, the additional ventilator in the rooms. So uh, I believe right now there's a mandate for the hospitals in this city to uh, be prepared to increase their bed capacity by 25%. So here it is again, where those same needs are, are absolutely necessary. It's, it's in its basic terms, it's the infrastructure to support a surge in, um, in inpatient uh, services. And while I can't really speak to the return on the investment, it's really more of a mandate, a necessity, and a requirement for uh, the conditions that we're all under right now. Okay, thank you. 
Yeah. Um, we're going to stick with infrastructure for a minute. I'd love to hear um, from a design perspective. You know, planning in healthcare facilities in a post-COVID uh, environment could include complex operational and infrastructure design consideration. Um, what are the most common design and staff reconfiguration plans uh, do you find yourself and your teams designing? Chris Prockner, I'd love for you to take this one. Well, that was great. Thanks, Chris and, and Rich, for teaming me up on infrastructure because no one wants to talk about the stuff that's hidden behind the walls and above the ceilings. So great intro on that regard. Um, but just integrating what you guys are talking about, you know, return on investment. Every, every dollar saved in operations goes into healthcare. So it's a big, big push to get those highly efficient items uh, out and installed into the, into the hospitals, whether it be retrofit or new. Um, but there is a balance, uh, infection control versus trade-off in energy conservation and carbon footprint reduction. Um, as energy codes are getting more stringent, uh, infection control standards are also pretty high, uh, high up there. And, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a balance between the two. So it definitely needs to be considered. Um, on a traditional focus for infrastructure, you know, the basics, air, med, gas, power, uh, those kind of things need to be considered, especially in the COVID uh, world, it being a transmitted via air. There's a respiratory disease, right? So we look at filtration, pressurization, ventilation, uh, humidification, UV light, a lot of new technologies out there that we're applying across the boards, uh, oversizing med gas farms or backbones or even distribution piping. You can get up to six times the amount of oxygen flow by simply going from a half inch pipe to a one inch pipe. Um, so pretty, pretty uh, cost effective measure there. Um, and non-traditional infrastructure approaches, Jim, I'm sure I'll weigh in on, um, you know, when it comes to space design, we look at the head walls now. We look at directional airflow to help uh, avoid healthcare workers from breathing in uh, a cough or a sneeze from an infected patient. So supply high, return low. Um, so that's uh, obviously a big thing that we're looking at now in terms of patient room design. Uh, clean, and in creating clean and dirty environments right, create that clean environment where those healthcare workers don't have to be dressed up in PPE for 14 hour shifts every day. So a lot of great things happen behind the walls, above ceilings and out of space. Chris, before, before I have James comment also, are you seeing more, um, more uh, streamlined or um, more flexibility requirements in terms of, you know, local tanks versus you know, hard plumbing for most of the services. What are what are you finding that uh, you're you're designing most of in current day time? Flexibility is key. Uh, standard oxygen flow rate. <clears throat> you know, when we hit COVID, it could be five to ten times more the amount of oxygen flow. So we want to look at, you know, where is there a potential spot we could uh, park a tanker or a flatbed truck outside in the street or on a sidewalk and tie into an emergency connection. Um, we're looking at uh, heating vaporizers so they don't freeze up with the uh, with the amounts of, of gas flow that we're trying to hit in these uh, large demand uh, scenarios. Um, so we're looking for flexibility to that standpoint where you don't have to spend a lot of money up front in terms of capital, but have it ready and available to accept something on a flatbed should you have a, a pandemic mode. If you do have a big checkbook, fantastic. We'd love to upsize your oxygen tank. <laughs> Jim, care to share your thoughts on that? <laughs> I would, Kim, yes, thank you. And, and I just want to thank uh, New and AMFP uh, for, uh, for inviting me to speak here today. Uh, it's a real privilege to be in front of the new team and uh, all of their supporters. I mean, what's, what's interesting, you know, if you're working in the AEC industry here in New York, we've actually seen the sort of triple threat to the healthcare industry over the last 20 years, right, on 9-11. Um, uh, the terrorist attacks caused a mass casualty event uh, uh, when uh, Sandy hit in 2012 we saw the effects of climate change and the need for resiliency in our facilities and now we have COVID we have a global pandemic and so the providers are, are now I think taking very seriously all of these things whereas maybe 20 or 25 years ago, if you were designing a new healthcare facility, it would be nice to make the facility more resilient, but if we can't do it, you know, we'll, we'll do it in the next round of projects. Or it would be nice to make the hospital more flexible, but if we can't afford to do it, we'll do it in the next round of projects. And that conversation is now completely flipped on its head because of these events. And, and so giving 
healthcare providers the flexibility to deal with a surge in demand uh, for services has really been uh, the key thing that has underlined uh, all of our planning and design work uh, for the providers in the region. So um, designing patient rooms that uh, can be converted from positive pressure to negative pressure rooms so that uh, air isn't moving from one patient room to an adjacent patient room. Uh, changing the mix of uh, intensive care rooms and acuity adaptable rooms so that there's more parity between the number of rooms there. Uh, designing other types of spaces in the hospital to be converted to bed spaces when they're needed, right? I mean, we were, we were asked to design um, a temporary hospital in Van Cortlandt Park for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and uh, you know, Javits was converted to a, a temporary field hospital and so on. But these are measures of last resort. It's much better for the community, for the city, and for the healthcare providers if the patients who need their care and services are in a healthcare facility. That's where the doctors and the nurses are. And so this is very much about flexibility, uh, both in terms of space and in terms of building systems. Great, thank you for that. Sure. So I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit, you know, well, it's interesting to consider how healthcare um, design could potentially change forever. You know, project managers currently grapple with construction challenges due to frequently changing guidelines that vary from city to city. Um, and in most metro areas, uh, new guidelines require additional staff on projects to check in on, on the workers and ensure that protocols are, are uh, being followed to keep everyone safe. So for example, in New York City, you know, we must maintain contact tracing and cleaning, and cleaning logs and taking workers' temperatures, et cetera. Um, you know, seeing an increase in demand in social distancing requirements and how that impacts how work is completed, et cetera. Um, we've also seen that the pandemic has demanded field hospitals and urgent care centers be built in a matter of days and weeks. Um, so as a result of these additional challenges and demands on, on our projects, on our, on our construction teams, on our design teams, what, what do you see as the future of the project timeline for design? Um, and then, and also for construction, I'd love for Jacoby to weigh in on this. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for just, you know, allowing me to be a part of the panel as we're talking about a lot of these uh, real issues in terms of, you know, project timelines. Just want to say to the panelists and even the younger people, anyone similar to the young lady who was on the presentation and, and the video, um, you know, it's a great organization. We want everyone definitely to, to, to contribute uh, and or donate and uh, just know that as we go through these tough times with the pandemic that, you know, things will pass, we'll all be prepared for it, but organizations like this definitely uh, push to get everyone over the hump. Uh, in terms of the project timeline, so there's, there's, there's two kind of parts to this. The question is, is there a, a need for the project timeline to be as, as, as rigid and robust in terms of building these temporary hospitals really quick? Uh, in my opinion, from what we're seeing at this health system, not as much. I don't see um, us running around really quick, uh, you know, the Javits construction, uh, putting uh, temps in the street. Um, anything really fast uh, will probably be tied to the caseload. And as you can see on the news, uh, the caseloads are trending down. So because of that, that demand really doesn't match. However, if it needs to be done, we can do it. We proved that we can do it. But and looking at the rate of return and even the rate of return for the system, uh, I think everyone has to review the efficacy of such. Does it make sense to do everything quick? Because we have so many lessons learned from the past surge, I think we'll be at a point where we'll be able to analyze a lot better. I think, so, so no, I don't see those fast builds, not at that rate, we've learned from that. The other side of it is the still the flexibility portion of it. And a lot of speakers uh, spoke about that. Uh, from most of us in the design background, I started in design background, we kind of plan, uh, we, we plan, then we propose something and we proceed. Uh, going forward, I think you just really have to be um, uh, f uh, f flexible. You know, we want to plan, propose, uh, look at the data, and then we kind of build the algorithm as we go to make sure that what we're doing really matches the needs of the health system. Because just rushing and building something over time um, 
If it's not as useful, then what are the implications to the health system financially? And also, you know, to, to, to us and the general population, we want to build things that people can use. That's great. Thanks. Chris Shaw, um, would love to hear your thoughts on this and what are you seeing in terms of project timelines in, in what you're working on? Um, it's dependent on the facilities. Um, I will tell you, like Presbyterian working for them, you know, now that they've seen the fast track process, that's what they're expecting on all their jobs. Um, you know, I'm working with Jacoby on a couple of projects now and, you know, he's, he's true to what he's saying. I mean, we, we just want to plan it out and see what makes sense. Um, and as far as planning for the COVID guidelines, I mean, hospitals, you know, as we're bidding jobs, they're asking us for our procedures and guidelines um, up front now, which is different, right? So they want to see that our plan going in on how we're going to treat the site and manage the site, right? So, you know, we're all doing the same thing, Kim. I'm sure you guys, everyone's doing the same procedures, um, but it all comes down to enforcement. And now DOB is going around with, with a fine schedule, right? And they're going to hit us up for fines. And, you know, we have to be ready for that. Um, and then obviously, you know, we've all been there now with people getting affected on job sites since the whole process, step notification, contract tracing, right? We got to sanitize the whole site. So I think for us, for us anyway, it comes down to, you know, fast track, like we talked about, but as far as the COVID procedure on the job sites too, just to say that we ultimately comes down to um, the, the safer people feel on site, the more we're going to get out of them and the more they're going to want to come to the site. So that was always been a big thing for us to make sure we're, we're following the guidelines, but, you know, enforcing it as well so the workers feel comfortable coming back to the site and we get as much production out of them as possible um, during this whole period. The other thing you got to keep an eye on with these fast track projects and the requests is that the supply chain we got to constantly keep an eye on the supply chain and see um, who's hurting right now because a lot of people are hurting so it's just a constant big communication process that we got to go with uh, a lot of these subcontractors and workers. Absolutely thank you for sharing. Um, you know, we've heard a lot of the, the panelists talk about um, the importance of flexibility in, in these times and being able to prepare for a surge and, and provide the proper care. I'm curious about uh, what space considerations are going into future planning of large scale builds and also renovations of existing spaces. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see, we'll definitely see more flexible spaces, but also interested in hearing about whether, you're, whether or not you think we'll head in a direction of larger spaces that can welcome more patients. And then how does social distancing requirements come into play as we're designing? Christine, I'd love, to, I'd love it if you take uh, the first step at this one. Sure, good afternoon. Great to be here with this panel with New. Um, thank you to New and Kathleen Cohen. And really all those, uh, our women trades are amazing. It's so empowering to see the video and it's so uh, such an important profession to be pushing design and construction as an industry. We make up 11% of the GDP and we need to be in the forefront of the conversation everywhere as we talk about restarting the economy. Um, so from a standpoint of uh, looking forward and how we plan out our space and looking at potential new construction, I really do think that uh, it's a dark time, it's gonna be a dark couple of weeks, but there's a huge hope on the horizon, whether we're talking about a vaccine coming um, and hopefully a day where we don't have to design social distancing, we just design flexibility into our spaces. Um, we, we design, I really like uh, James's comment because it's really about acuity adaptability in our walls. Um, we as health and hospitals have not had the pleasure of building new hospitals, we've had the existing hospitals forever and we will never have, uh, hopefully someday we can raise that money from someone with lots of deep pockets where we can have a building that we can name. But today we're really focused on uh, really bringing our system to modernization, to a level of equity for our patients and to really ensuring that we're leveraging uh, the good strong bones we have and bringing in that critical uh, really state of the art energy efficiency that Chris, both Christopher's talked about actually and realizing it's like a triple Chris going on in this panel. Um, but I really think that um, figuring out how we can really modernize what we have. Uh, we never have been running at the census of the number of beds we have. And so it's really an opportunity to build up the old bones we have and really find creative, innovative ways to do that in a carbon neutral type of way and really leverage that. I mean, I would say during the first surge, we were truly fortunate that our hospitals were designed for a different day of um, 
of, and they had the capability of negative pressure, not for COVID, but we were able to really leverage that in the moment and um, for TB. And so I think we just have to be creative about what we have, be realistic about what funding we have today and um, not, I don't think we should go nuts on social distancing. The goal is we cure this damn thing and we move forward and we fight for infrastructure funding for healthcare and do it right and do it thoughtfully, protect our walls from a resiliency perspective. But I think in the long term, we just have to hold the fort down and plan for uh, modernizations that can happen around an operating health system. We definitely need to continue seeing our patients, our hospitals, um, are starting, you know, we have to have a hot and a cold area. We have to have the ability to care for COVID and the ability to take care of that cancer and tumor that we got to cut out the same time we're curing COVID. And so that's where we're trying to go. Our trauma ones, our, our receiving locations, our community hospitals are um, taking the amount of patients they can and we're level loading across our system. And so that I think is, uh, we need to be fighting for more funding when it comes to having that duplicitous ability, ability for these duplicated care and make sure that we have uh, really, I would say the public confidence that we're able to care for you safely. And we have, you know, the right air exchange rates in these different areas. And we're being smart about our scheduling and, and bringing people in in a just in time way. I think healthcare is a sector where uh, we thrive in innovation and being fast and it's a it's a testament to our consultants our contractors uh the the clinicians who are amazing as well and i think we can we can beat this disease we can bring it back and then we can prepare so we're ready should there be something else coming our way that we can't anticipate but we have that ability to turn ourselves on and off and be flexible in our spaces great point i hope that answered i kind of yeah really no, that's great. And, and it, it shares, you know, a different thought of not always necessarily thinking we need to build so much more, but be able to have flexibility and adaptability in what we do have with the right upgrades to be able to accommodate whatever comes in the future. Elsie, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in your, your comments on, on this also. Um, do you have anything uh, additional to share um, to Christine's points? Yeah, so I mean, flexibility is always key, right? Especially for um, New York City hospitals because um, our hospitals is, exist, and you know, it's not like we're you know in the location where you could build a new hospital, replacement hospital, or expand in any way. So New York City hospital have a, have a unique challenge in that way that we can't expand our the our four walls, our four walls, our buildings, or our buildings. So there is like no new building that's required. Um, it's, it's, it's rare in, in one's career that, that's based in New York that we get to get build a new building. Um, you know, I was lucky to be involved in a few when I worked for Destiny, which is uh, quite interesting. It was quite a lot of fun to build new buildings, but you know, not in New York City. Um, and anyway, flexibility definitely is key within our four walls. Um, you know, there are, you know, I mean, it's already been done before because again, you know, we, as, as um, New York City hospitals have to do more with less, with more less space and so on. And um, especially um, in Montefiore and in the Bronx community, we always have a, a huge amount of patient that comes through our doors um, because that's just our, our community that we serve. And so there's never enough room for anything. So whenever we build, we always say, well, you know what, let's put some extra gas um, in like an ED bay, right? I mean, so, so the other thing that I want to I want to talk about, and I, I I don't think we should not talk about this when we're talking about being ready and you know uh, improving our processes so that we could deliver project faster, right? You talked about timeline before. Regulatory, I'm sorry to say, it seemed to be a huge hurdle that we have. I mean. Of course, we need regulatory agency to tell us and to have criteria as to what you know to with the code and and making sure that we um, fit into we we provide services that we build an environment that is um, that is co-compliant as well as you know that doesn't do any harm to the patient, but 
some of the code requirement and some of the interpretation of it is really very difficult for us to overcome. I mean, you know, like it, and there's always conflicts between different agencies, like fire department from New York, New, FDNY might have a different requirement than, you know, the DOH, you know, and, and so on and so forth. And these kind of conflicts make it difficult for us to navigate around and negotiate around in order to deliver a project. So the timeline gets affected because of that. The amount of, of, of um, services, the amount of um, base and treatment area that we could create and the number of units that we could create effect, gets affected as well because, you know, I mean, I, I could tell you how I can't tell you how many times a nurse manager tells me that he doesn't need a lounge, they don't need a lounge, they don't need a, 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 a lounge area for the patient because, but, you know, DOH requires that. Um, so we have to carve out the space for lounge and, and as soon as we leave, I hate to say it, I, I mean, I've been doing this for almost three decades. As soon as we leave, they convert into something else. And, and it's just space that is a premium in New York City hospital that is being used for something that they're never going to find a use for, but it's required by code. So a lot of these regulatory stuff really needs to, there needs to be, you know, an honest look at it with with input from the hospital, people who actually run these units and, and, and use these spaces and say, you know, what do we have to change to make it real instead of, you know, just following the book because, you know, someone, you know, a group of people in, in an agency sat around and said, yeah, that, that's, that's a good idea. We, we should have that. I, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be dis disrespectful to anybody, but it's just very frustrating because we're trying to get stuff done. One of the reasons why we're able to, and in Montefiore, we did build a, a huge, a, a whole bunch of, um, I forget how many, what's the count, I should know this before this, this conference, right? How many beds we built as surge beds. And we were able to deliver that because there was an executive order from the governor and we were able to get it done. So. Can you imagine if we, I don't mean to limit all of it, like, you know, what we had to go through in April, March, uh, March, April, but at least eliminate some of that red tape so that we could properly deliver, because what is the goal here? We're supposed to preserve and help the community as far as their health is concerned. So what's with the red tape? What's with all the stuff that we have to check off and all the lists that we have to check? You know what I mean? It yeah. just doesn't, Christine's laughing, I love this. <laughs> Because you guys are all that, that, that's why these kind of conferences are so terrific. And by the way, thank you for, very much for inviting me. I think, you know, New is, is a tremendous, uh, um, you know, uh, organization to try to help, you know, um, women and to get into a, a non-traditional, I'm repeating your title of your organization, but it's, it's really fantastic because, you know, I, I joined this three decades ago and into the AEC world and it's like until I started working and I looked around and I'm like, okay, I, f I feel like I'm the only one, you know? Um, so thank you very much and it's really an honor to be here. Thanks for being here. We appreciate your comments. Um, be before I, I continue on and Rich, I, I do have um, a continuation of that last question for you on the construction side. So I'd love for you to chime in on that in a minute, but I'd just like to share um, again, that, you know, we just want to thank um, all of you that are donating right now. We're seeing a lot of activity and we really appreciate everybody's efforts uh, to help raise money for this wonderful organization. Um, also want to reiterate that um, uh, Adco Electric is doubling down today and they're matching uh, all donations received up to $10,000. So please, um, you know, it is this season of giving. Uh, make sure you uh, deep, dig into those pockets and, and make a make a donation to new. It's it's so well worth it. These women's lives are changed forever uh, by being a part of this organization. So just wanted to share that. We appreciate Adco's gift um, and just know that any donation doesn't matter how big or small is so uh, so much appreciated from the organization. So keep keep donating. We really appreciate it. Um, we're uh, it's so important to continue the the mission. So Rich, um, in, while we discuss flexibility in spaces and timelines and, and all of the um, measures that we need to take with all the additional challenges, what, what, are you, what are you all doing on your job sites to help mitigate some of the potential schedule delays, um, knowing that the, the physicians need these spaces as quickly as possible, um, providing the flexibility? How, how, how soon are you getting engaged with the design in terms of 
offering phasing and constructability analyses. We'd love to hear a little bit about that on these calls as we partner. Uh, Kim, I'll, I'll jump right on it. I, I wanted to say first that you mentioned it twice and just about every panelist so far has used the word flexibility. That's probably number one on the list. We, we all have to be a lot more agile. And you actually brought up another good part in this question about the early engagement. It's pretty interesting how we're seeing an absolute difference in the, um, in the, uh, the immediacy of being involved at the earlier stages. It's, it's, it's very rewarding to be involved that early, and it actually is an opportunity to contribute as the design develops. And uh, Chris Shore brought up a point a little while ago about uh, sourcing the materials and, and the availability of vendors. And it's not just here, as we all know, you know, quite a bit of the, uh, the material and the products that we are responsible for is going to come from somewhere else in this country. And we've seen the Midwest get hit by, uh, you know, their surges out there. And the fact is that's where a lot of manufacturing is done here. And sometimes we hear about these crazy lead times. I'm sure you've experienced it for, you know, heavy equipment, you know, six months, even longer, which you want to think that that's insane. But the fact is, those plants may not be operating at full capacity right now. That's right. And now we're just talking domestic right now. Now, of course, we all have products that are from overseas, and that's a further consideration. Do we really want and do we really have to have the stone or the glass from somewhere far, far away? Because there are a whole nother level of challenges there, whether it's the, the virus that's impacted uh, uh, suppliers in, in Europe or is it the shipping or is it clearing the uh, the customs which is you know sometimes a challenge it's even more of a challenge right now so the input that we can provide earlier in the process and securing materials and uh, and equipment earlier in the process is going to contribute to mitigating you know those last minute surprises that it's hung up somewhere or there's a delay it's a critical path item you know, we're all in the same business, and it's safe to say that we've all encountered a situation like that in the past. Part of our job is to try to mitigate that and try to avoid that. And it is real, and it is happening. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, I'd like to switch a little bit to funding. I, I, and Elsie, you mentioned, you know, concern over funding and using the funding that you have to either retrofit the spaces that we have. Um, you know, like you mentioned, it's few and far between in New York City that you'll see a ground up, but a lot of renovation is possible. So. Um, you know, with the increasing demand for services um, and increase in upgrades and, and things like that, do, do you foresee hospitals having sufficient capital to continue building at the rate um, that we're building and addressing the current and future predicted needs of care? Uh, what, what's, what's your sense on that for, for the current trend? So, you know, we, rarely does hospital get hit with just one thing. I mean, if it's just one thing, all right, we, we could probably deal with that. But it's multiple things happening at the same time. Even before COVID, um, there's, there's a capital crunch for, for healthcare industry, for all the hospitals, because, you know, you have all kinds of reform. And, you know, the policies, I mean, not a lot, unless you live in the world that we live in, uh, the policy changes in the government um, has an impact on, on hospital and how they get funded. Um, Montefiore depend um, greatly, as you can imagine, because of the community we're in on Medicaid and Medicare. So if this policy changes, um, and so does N uh, NY, um, 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 New York Hospital Corp, um, the, you know, we depend highly on, on Medicaid and Medicare, the reimbursement that we get, and how they change a the policy, how they change a the reimbursement, and the rules that they change, and so on and so forth. And the, sometimes, you know, it's, it's not written as such, but, you know, there's, there's penalty to, you know, to certain things. So, um, you know, all that equals out, I mean, you know, they, you could say that there's a separate capital budget, but really it's the same wallet that you come out of eventually. And, you know, uh, administrators, senior leadership end up having to make hard decisions as to, okay, what are they gonna do? They're gonna, you know, they have to, you know, evaluate what the operation budget is versus what the capital budget is. Um, this COVID thing specifically, uh, the way that it impacted, you know, the hospital uh, industry is that, you know, there's a lot of elective surgery that a lot of people don't, I'm surprised, actually, a lot of people, I, I talk to people who are not in, in this world, 
Um, and, you know, because a lot of the elective surgery have been canceled, a lot of the elective stuff has been canceled, a lot of the patients who are, you know, usually go see the doctors and so on and so forth for certain procedures are elected not to do so and, and is delaying their services and treatment and procedures and whatever. All of that is revenue based for the hospital and we lost that. We lost that for during the, the search uh, during COVID. And hopefully we're, we're not going to have to be mandated to do that again uh, for the second search. Um, so, you know, that has an impact on our bottom line. And as I said before, it's all the same wallet, right? Um, it's, it's, you know, if, you know, decisions have to be made, just like your own household, decisions have to be made when the income is lessened. Um, so, look, there is, there is light at the end of the tunnel for sure, because hospitals have needs, um, needs that are, that are, you know, that has to be addressed, you know, like infrastructure needs, uh, which is, which is one of my favorite things to advocate for because, you know, like Chris say, it's behind the wall, on the ceiling, in a mechanical room that no one ever sees. I love to visit those spaces when I visit a hospital because I want to see what they got, what's, what's the um, guts that's making them operate. Um, but it's not, it's not fancy. It's not, no one could put a tag and say, you know, so-and-so donated, you know, this air handling unit, you know, like it doesn't happen. So, so, uh, but it's needed. So um, there are some things, so they have to, you know, I, I don't envy them. The uh, senior leadership and the capital committee have to sit down and evaluate what's, what they need to go forward with and, and set priorities. Uh, and that's just so much need. And, you know, there's still unknown as to where we're going to go with the second search. So there's a lot of, meetings that and decision making that they have to make and a lot of it has to, it's time you know they need time to evaluate what's going to go forward are we sure. going to build again of course we're going to build again you know healthcare industry um, a lot of architects and engineers probably 20 years ago 30 years ago it's like i don't want to do healthcare it's not it's not you know fancy it's not publishable it's not you know like they want to build uh, you know i'm sorry james <laughs> But you know, a lot of I've been doing hospitals for thirty years, Elsie. It's okay. All right, but <laughs> you are you of the field, right, James? I mean, there's a lot of architects. You do hospitals, you know? Yeah, that's not fancy. So, um, and anyway, um, now, like James could tell you, it is the one sector of architecture that will keep going no matter what. Um, during recession, as a matter of time, in fact, we are, you know, healthcare industry are the ones that will continue to build because they want to take advantage of the time, you know, where the cost of construction is lower because there's a recession going on. Right, Rich? Um, <laughs> and Chris, you know, so, so hospital will keep going and we will build, we'll continue to build. It's just that right now, it's, it's wait and see type of situation. Okay. Thank you. Um, Jacoby, interested to hear your thoughts on, you know, Elsie mentioned, um, you know, with funding and, and having to make difficult decisions. Um, what are you seeing on your end? And, and when you come across, you know, do you spend your money here? Or do you spend your money there? Like, how do you, how do you help? So I'll uh, just, just one, one, one piece of it is now that, you know, she just mentioned that, you know, I'm going to get a discount on my next project from Chris. So Chris, I'll be looking for, for that discount on, on, on my cost. So uh, know that. Um, I look at it like this, you know, for healthcare spending, you know, a, a part of the reason people on the panel, because they want to know where we're going. Uh, are there going to be jobs for us to to bid uh, in terms of design and construction? And to Elsie's point, definitely they are. Um, like your car, you got to put gas in the engine for you to, for you to move forward. If you don't, you're not going to go anywhere. In order to have places for these elective surgeries uh, and any surgeries, you have to spend for the infrastructure you have to, you, you can't sit in place. And what I'm seeing here at iHealth System is uh, because they understand the importance of that, these rooms have to be functioning and they have to have the airflow, we're gonna move forward. However, what, I, what I'm enjoying and I'm seeing more is more collaboration, not just from uh, leadership to PDC, but leadership to the clinician. So everyone's in the room uh, really supporting uh, understanding why we're making these decisions and you know because I'll be honest in these toughest times with the crises within this crisis 
uh, uh, people are really engaged more than at least for my time and you know I've seen is people engage to find out how do we do this how do we keep the job going uh, what are our options what are our changes what can we build right now that's cost effective uh, that will allow us to get patients in the door provide health care and uh, support with either the surge or, or the general uh, safety of the hospital or, or moving forward uh, of the campus. And for, I'll say, people who are interested in the industry, again, that, that term flexibility is, is more paramount. You know, for me starting out, it was, you know, you get, you, you meet, you get a sign off of the drawings, and you're off to the races. Uh, being able to double back and have these conversations uh, so we can spend appropriately because we are going to spend is just, is key. That's great. Thanks so much. Um, I'd like to continue the conversation just um, with some final thoughts on elective procedures and design and how do we how do we design hospitals and the renovations that we're doing so that normal operations such as these elective procedures can continue through a time like now in the pandemic and not disrupt regular patient care um, and also keep the funding sources coming in. I'd love to. I'd love to. Um, hear from Christine and, and Jim on what, what you're seeing in terms of the, how you're thinking about design um, and how you're keeping uh, the, the programs separated and, and what, what resources you're using to come up with those decisions. And then after Christine and James uh, talk, I'd love to hear from Chris Prockner about you know, what, what he's seen on the design side to help with that effort. Thanks Christine, so much. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so I would say, uh, you know, one thing we did after the first surge was we really made a strategic decision to really increase our um, elective procedures as well. You know, our elective procedures are actually critical procedures and we never shut down fully our ORs. So, I mean, we will be looking at and ensuring we have the right amount as well as completely revamped ORs over time, but you always have to do that and thread the needle appropriately to ensure you never impact ongoing operations and you're uh, investing in the locations where we have kind of obviously a key backlog, uh, and we're sharing those um, specific areas of service lines across our hospitals. So those are all the things that we're looking to do um, from a standpoint of uh, leveraging the facts that we have 11 acute care hospitals that we can really um, ensure that we uh, share the mix of patients as well as, you know, we have a full scale EPIC uh, system that finally was fully launched last calendar year. And that also allows us to see uh, visibly, you know, where we can um, leverage each of the spaces that exist as we look at that, those assessments across our system. So I think uh, one thing we are trying to do is just make sure as we look at our surge planning even as well, um, we've really tried to restack some of our services so that we could be as efficient as possible. Uh, we kind of have the day surgery area that we're final, you know, we're actually in the middle of wrapping up our last emergency construction projects, uh, phase two. And that includes uh, restacking some of the surgical areas so that they kind of are the most efficiently placed uh, from a care environment perspective as well. As far as uh, healthcare infrastructure funding, there's not enough. Um, and actually, I would staunchly, firmly hope that we can collectively advocate for healthcare infrastructure funding when people talk about stimulus, when they talk about the bridges crumbling, so are our hospitals. Let's not forget that. We just came out of a pandemic. We survived because we're New Yorkers and that's what we do. Um, but we need infrastructure funding. FEMA didn't open up category E. I don't think they ever will. However, there's different ways to talk about uh, infrastructure funding. You could talk about stimulus. You can talk, talk about reopening the economy. We should not talk about uh, three month timelines to complete. Uh, uh, my colleague Elsie was correct in that, you know, the CON process is back up and going. And, uh, you know, my emergency dialysis uh, dens were open in two sites and the rest of them got shut down uh, because we're back to the norm. So I think we, we definitely want to give ourselves enough time on a long-term infrastructure reinvestment in our healthcare systems, especially those healthcare systems that are taking care of Medicare and Medicaid patients, that we need to make sure we're taking care of our public health. And uh, that only comes with having equity in being able to invest in our environment. So uh, we look forward to partnering with everybody on this uh, great panel, as well as the industry on that. And I, I would say that uh, we're, you know, we're continuing looking at care, care models. We're in the middle of 
COVID centers of excellence. We're gonna open up these post recovery uh, primary care sites in the most uh, impacted neighborhoods. We've opened up Tremont in the Bronx and we're gonna open one in Queens and Brooklyn. And those are gonna be care areas for recovery because COVID's tough. It sucks. I lived through it myself. I know what it's like being a long hauler and having foggy brain or I blame it on that. But uh, we wanna make sure that we are collectively coming together and beating this, fighting this, fighting for our hospital systems, making sure they're getting the right appropriate flexible spaces that we need to have the best environment for all patients. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. Jim and Chris, love to hear your thoughts from a design side on how we can um, be more proactive in design and creating these separations necessary and, and building in the flexibility. Sure. So first of all, I just want to say amen to uh, Christine and Jacoby and Elsie's comments on the regulatory environment and on flexibility. I mean, regulatory tends to lag technology and industry needs by five to eight years, roughly. They sort of play catch up. Um, and we, ju we just have to figure out a better way to regulate healthcare. The current system is not supportive. Uh, of rapid change in the industry, and the industry is prime for rapid change. So having said that, I mean, finance equals flexibility, right? I mean, there's just, it's just that simple. COVID shut the whole system down. Um, I know of some hospitals and systems in the region that were losing 150 and $200 million a month because everything else they were doing stopped and all they were doing was caring for COVID patients. And that can't be allowed to happen again. So with a lot of our clients, we're looking at this from a systemic perspective, uh, look across the whole health system. So in the event of a pandemic, it may not necessarily be that the COVID patients have to be at the, at the main medical center, that you could design ambulatory care centers and other facilities that they have and are now pushing out into the communities to serve as those facilities in the event of a pandemic. And so what that changes is maybe your approach to an exam room, right? So instead of doing an 80 square foot exam room with no medical gases, maybe you do a 120 square foot exam room and it has medical gases mm -hmm. and you now have this flexibility. And by the way, it ends up being a better patient experience when it's just a regular exam room. Uh, anyway, um, we have a half a dozen ambulatory care centers on the boards right now and none of them have what you would consider to be a conventional waiting room. They don't have waiting rooms. Uh, we, we, call, we, have, we do pause waiting. And what we do is we shift, we shift what we consider to be these sort of soft or administrative spaces. You know, I mentioned waiting, Elsie mentioned, you know, lounges and other types of spaces that were required to produce for the staff. We're taking different approaches to those kinds of spaces so we can turn the saved square footage over either for clinical spaces, you know, more exam rooms, more treatment spaces, more ORs, or to the medical staff, more workspace, more space for them to actually be with their patients or be with each other and, uh, and deal with the cases that are in front of them. And so it's kind of a rethinking of the program in terms of how it works, but also a redistribution of the services in terms of the service area for the medical center. Lastly, I, I wouldn't, there are two more points. One, I wouldn't want to leave out changes on the, the big medical centers themselves. Um, Health and Hospitals and Sinai and, and Montefiore all operate large medical centers in the city. Thinking about uh, what we've been calling multi-track operations through the hospital so that maybe um, from the emergency department all the way through, there's a, there's a care stream, say, dedicated to orthopedics under conventional circumstances, right? That should there be another pandemic could be separated, could be isolated from the rest of the care streams, you know, from the ED to the ORs, to the inpatient rooms, so that uh, COVID patients in the current example could be within that stream and all of the other operations could continue as normal. Uh, and it's that kind of stuff. It affects the air systems, obviously. It expect, affects the kind of spaces you designed, what their adjacencies are, how they can be separated in the event of a pandemic. But we can do this. We can do this. We have a much better feel for, for what this is going to take. And um, we're a lot smarter about uh, these things now than we were eight months ago. 
And uh, we, need to, we need to be in a position where we can apply the lessons that we've learned. Last thing, and then I'll shut up, Tim, I promise. Um, <laughs> Is is uh, well, Chris and 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 Chris and and some of the other folks on this call are used to this stuff. But um, the last thing is telemedicine. I don't want to forget the importance of telemedicine. A lot of people have gotten very comfortable, you know, doing exam and consults and just touching base with their care providers and so on through telemedicine programs that most of the providers have, and. Um, you know, uh, Mass General up in, in, in Boston as a client of ours, they were seeing something like in, in October, November of last year, they were seeing maybe 500 telemedicine visits a month in October and November. In April, they saw 20,000, 20, from 500 to 20,000. Now, is it going to stay at that level? Probably not, but I guarantee you it's not going to fall all the way back to 500. People have gotten used to this. So I do think um hospitals are going to distribute their services differently we're going to rethink how we design and program spaces regardless of where they are in the system uh and and consumers of healthcare are going to access their care differently and the system needs to be allowed to respond to that so that's okay okay Thank you. Chris, uh, just to, to close the, the thought on, um, you know, how we move forward in the future and, and just uh, feeding off of what Jim just talked about on the design side from, from a, you know, an MEP perspective um, and, and for planning for the future. Uh, can you share your thoughts before I wrap up for us today? Sure, sure, absolutely. So I hate to beat the word to death, but I think everybody used the word flexibility at least a half a dozen times in each one of their presentations. So I'm going to use it one last time and and uh, talk about infrastructure in, in, in non-traditional measures. You know, not looking at big heavy duty stuff like chillers and boilers and all that kind of stuff, but how do you leverage technology? To Jim's point, that traditional uh, waiting room, which I've had three kids growing up and sitting in a waiting room, waiting to see a doctor, usually come out more sick than you do going in. But how do you leverage technology so you can time those visits, show up to a building, uh, perhaps integrate destination dispatch at your elevator systems and all through software, be able to have real-time access to your healthcare provider and go right to the floor. So we're seeing a lot, a ton of IT being implemented into renovation projects, into new projects. We're fortunate enough to be working on a couple of new hospitals with you folks. And it ranges literally from uh, room technologies like an ICU room where you have uh, video monitoring instead of in-person monitoring to reduce the amount of trips a healthcare worker has to have into a, a you know a contaminated environment, um, all the way to looking at different building units and putting in central systems that I could have a you know half a floor pressurized positive, half a floor pressurized negative, or whole floor positive, whole floor negative, go 100% outside air, all through a keystroke through the BMS. So there's a whole array of things, but I think you're going to see a, a big common thread right now is going to be how do we leverage technology going forward. Thank you, Chris. Sure. And Chris, Chris Shaw, I'm going to lean on you for a minute, um, but I just want to, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention as we move forward uh, with new in, you know, in the future um, and the projects that we do, all of us in the construction industry, uh, the design industry, and, and all of our clients, it's so important if you could help new by uh, de designating and requesting that your projects become signature projects. One of the things that we did on the MSK, um, David H. Koch Cancer Center on the Upper East Side, is we designated that job as a, as a signature project. And, and the goal of a signature project is to have 15% of the labor force be women on the job. And a big resource of the women who come to us uh, on the projects is from new. Um, and so, you know, there, there's language you can write into your contracts uh, that ask for best effort. You know, we can introduce our, our trade contracting pool to uh, non-traditional employment for women who, you know, if they're not already in, involved with them. But it's so important um, that we continue to advocate for new. Um, we, we indicate and we designate our projects as signature projects and push for that goal. Um, you know, as hard as we work, if you look at the numbers, you know, only four to five percent of our, our workers on the job sites are, are women. So, you know, the more we can, the more we can write into the contracts, you know, as signature projects and, and, and goals for percentage, uh, it's huge. So, Chris, I know I, I've had such an amazing run with, with New. It's been, I don't know, 12, 13 years I've been affiliated with New, and it's been such a joy to work with these women and get to know them. 
as a board member of NEW, just final, final thoughts on how, how rewarding has it been for you to work with, with non-traditional employment for women and, then, and the women who have graduated from the program. Um, what can you share with folks who are just meeting, meeting the organization for the first time today? Um, what can you share with them about your thoughts of the organization? Um, yeah, this has been a, definitely a great organization for me to be part of. Um, you know, one of the things, and this is what I always tell people when I, when I became um, the, uh, the vice president of, of Driscoll in New York, um, one of my old um, colleagues uh, said to me, now, now it's time to do some good. You know, you, you, you got a position where now you got to start, start giving, some, giving stuff, stuff back. So it's been really rewarding for me to be part of this. I couldn't think of another, you know, anything else better to do. Um, just to reiterate with you what you were saying about the signature projects, I think a lot of these hospitals are requiring um, MWB participation now in their contracts. They're starting to show whether it be best efforts or um, percentages, right? So I think if we could work with them and turn it into, all right, let's, let's take it another level and start requiring workforce participation, we could almost make a lot of projects in hospitals uh, signature projects, which would be terrific for new, right? Um, I think that, that that's a that's a goal we could definitely work work towards here. Thank you for sharing those thoughts. I, I know we ran a little over today, but I think those of us on the on the panel could talk about all this stuff for for hours. So we we all wish we had more time. Um, I just want to reiter reiterate, you know, on behalf of New, um, you know, all of your donations are sincerely appreciated. Um, please consider if you haven't already uh, made a donation. Please consider making a, a donation today. It goes for an amazing cause. The women, um, the women's lives are changed forever just by being a part of this organization, and they're the beneficiaries of our donations. So, um, if you if you can help out, um, it's so so much appreciated. Would like to um, thank our um, our partners again: LF Driscoll Healthcare, Lendlease, and Jaros Van Bowles. Um, also, would like to thank Adco Electric one more time for. Uh, their generous gift of matching up to $10,000 of all donations uh, received today. And um, thank all of our panelists one more time. You all have been amazing in sharing your thoughts and very generous um, in participating in this panel today. Couldn't have done it without you uh, and really appreciate uh, uh, everything that everyone did today to be a part of this panel. Thank you.